Don't sit down yet. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Just look at it. Let's just lift our hands and worship Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, we worship you. Yes, Lord. We came to worship you. Yes, Lord. Oh, we came to receive from you. Oh, we want to learn about Thank all your ways Jesus. for Jesus. We want to know everything we can know about all you did for us at Calvary and all that you blessed us with, all that you've given us, who you've made us in you, who you are in us, and we worship you. We praise you with all of our hearts. We thank you for your precious blood. We're washed white as snow in. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that each one of us is believers in here. We're crowned with your glory and honor. We're crowned with your glory and honor. You've set us over the works of your hands. You've put all things in subjection to us. And you left nothing that's not put under us. And we praise you for that. And we give you all the glory for it. And Father, we receive from your anointing in here. We receive your word. We receive our faith greatly increased in this service tonight. And we yes. thank you for it in Jesus' name. Yes. We give you all the glory. Amen. 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 Great. Amen. 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 You may be seated now. Glory to God. Good to see you tonight. Glory to God. I uh, appreciate uh, you allowing me to come back and minister. I like coming to your church here. Y'all got a good church here. And, uh, and, yeah. and it's fun to uh, teach the word to people that want to hear the word. Man. Amen. And you've heard me teach enough already now that. You know, I, 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 I teach, so I need you to think. I need you to do a little thinking. Come on. You, you, a lot of times, you know, a lot of services, you know, you, you get a lot of shouting and everything, and people, I think, sometimes come to church like it's a Broadway show. And just whatever the preacher's preaching, amen, amen. And sometimes when you leave, if you say, do you know what he said? Um, <laughs> no. It sure was good. It's because it was loud. And it got you all fired up. And you, you need to think about what people are preaching to you. Yeah. And what they're teaching. Because some churches, you can, I can get up here and scream and shout and say, we're all going to hell tomorrow. Amen, brother. Amen. And they didn't pay a bit of attention. <laughs> so what I just said, we're all going to hell. They didn't pay a bit of attention to what I just said. It just got loud. And, and when Christians have been trained, when I get loud, you shout. Yeah. Yeah. No, you shout if it's in faith. If it's the word of God, if it's worth shouting for, that's where we shout, right? All right. So I want you to think tonight, because we're going to look at some scriptures here, that I, I want to share a, a, a revelation from the word of God with you that's just very, very important. Pastor, do you want me to put the mic down a little lower? Okay. How about right there? Is that better? It's fine with me. Is it too loud for you guys? No. Okay. All right. Praise God. Well, last time I was here, remember, I was um, I was talking about where remember we're teaching on what I like to call the mystery of Christ. Anybody y'all been reading your book? Yeah. You have. Okay. Good. Good. And uh, I hope you uh, I hope you, if you get a chance, uh, definitely go to our YouTube channel. How many of y'all been over to our YouTube channel? Check some of our videos out. Okay, several of you. That's good. I, I'm doing a new series right now called The Power uh, of the Kingdom. And I think I just did part five today. Usually I try to do two a week if I'm not out of town. And again, if you're subscribed to our channel, I think your cell phone should notify you that. I mean, I get notifications from people that it should say Dwayne Norman live on YouTube. And sometimes when it says that, you're busy doing something, so you can't watch. But if you miss it, I'll always re-download it. So you can go back and go back and check it out. But I think we've got about 180 videos on our YouTube channel now. Of course, they're all free. And I like what Keith Moore said. You know what Keith Moore is? Pastor Keith Moore in Missouri, great pastor, great teacher, but he gives all his CDs away for free. Everything's free because they have a ministry there called Word Supply that people sell money into so he can give away everything for free, which is wonderful. And uh, But he'll say if it's free, there's no excuse. Yeah. Amen. If it's free, there's no excuse. Yeah. So, you, know, you can't say, well, I would have, but I can't afford it. I don't have enough money. It's free. That's right. What's free mean? No excuse. No excuse. All the videos on my YouTube channel are free. Therefore, there's no excuse. It's just up to you to make time to go go listen to them. I, I'm on YouTube every single day. 
I'm, like I said, I've told you before, I'm always listening to ministers teach the word. I get put, I hook it up on my cell phone. I put my cell phone in my pocket and let it play while I'm, while I'm washing dishes or whatever I'm doing. I'm, you know, I have something playing if I'm on my computer doing something. If it's not something I got to really concentrate on, I get. I mean, I go through it. I can listen to a lot. I just keep the word flowing. Try to keep it flowing constantly as much as I possibly can. And, you know, dry, you know, driving over here. I'm praying, driving over here, and I'm listening to the word driving over here. I just keep keep that word flowing all the time. And the word cleanses you. Remember, the Bible Ephesians calls it the washing of the water of the word. Yeah. See, you get enough word in you, it'll clean all the junk out. Yeah. It'll just clean all the junk out of our lives if we get enough word in us. But see, that, that the, the key though is it takes time to do that. It's not you, you can't get enough word in you if you decide I'm going to spend an hour listening to the word tonight. Then I may do that again next month. That's not enough. No. Because in between then, you devote all your time to putting put a lot of junk in your life. I so try. Keep putting that word in you all the time. It, it cleans you out. It keeps you clean all the time. Totally cleans you out. And you may not notice it right now, but about six months from now, you look back to where you were, you realize, wow, I've changed since then. And it's the word of God doing that. Well, last time I was talking about, you know, the, the errors of the mystery of Christ. Remember the seven errors I mentioned to you is that we were crucified with Christ. We died with them. We we're buried with them. We we're made alive with them. We conquered hell with them. We we're resurrected with them. Then what's the seventh one? What happened after Jesus arose from the dead? He went somewhere. He said it in the heaven, didn't he? Sat down at God's right hand. And I was talking to you last week a lot about uh, being quick and made alive together with Christ. And I was talking to, to you about a lot about uh, what verse, Pastor? Romans 8, 2. Romans 8, 2. About Romans 8, 2. That the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Sin death. Well, if, before I move on to, to another, um, to, 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 to get on to the, uh, when we, you know, conquer the devil with Jesus, especially... I want to talk some more about, about um, what Jesus actually did for us so that we can be made alive. I touched on it last week. I, it, it, Jesus bore spiritual death for us, didn't he? He bore spiritual death for us. See, one thing to always remember uh, when you study uh, the Bible about the mystery of Christ is that you can, you can have no identification without substitution. The reason that we're healed of our sicknesses and diseases is because Jesus was our substitute and bore them for us. Sure. The reason we're free from financial lack and poverty and can be uh, prosper financially now is because Jesus bore our poverty for us when he went to the cross. The reason that we, we, we're free from spiritual death and be born again is because somebody had to bear spiritual death and, and, and free us from it. Sure. See, there can be no identification with Jesus and healing if somebody wasn't your substitute to bear your sickness and disease. So when Jesus came to this earth, he fully identified with us. He became like we were, so we can be like he is now. And now you have the verse in 1 John 4, 17 that says, As he is, so are we in this world. It didn't say as he is, so will we be when we get to heaven. It's as we are right now, as Jesus is right now. But to me... Um, I believe that, you know, Jesus, he bore the whole curse of the law for us. And we can't possibly imagine what that was like. All, all, all the sin and evil and wickedness and just ungodliness. It just, it, it just, we, we just could not fathom that as, as with our little, with our brains, all that Jesus really bore for us. We, we know the Bible describes a lot, but I believe the, the worst thing that Jesus bore for us was spiritual death. Now remember, I mentioned last time, spiritual death does not mean to cease to exist. Because when Jesus came to the earth, nobody on the planet was spiritually alive yet. Everybody was spiritually dead. If spiritual death means to cease to exist, that meant nobody existed when Jesus came here. The devil and all his demons are spiritually dead, but yet they exist. And there are lots of people on the earth today that are spiritually dead. They're lost. They're not born again. But they still exist, don't they? So always remember that. Spiritual death does not mean to cease to exist. Spiritual death has, has nothing to do with whether you exist or not. It has to do with who you exist with. That's right. If you're spiritually dead, if you have that nature of sin and death, that's Satan's nature in your spirit because you're not born again yet, that means you exist, but Satan's your father. 
Remember, Jesus told the, the religious leader that. He said, your father's the devil. They didn't care for that. Yeah. Yeah. He called them liars. I like reading that. I think it's in John chapter 8. I like reading that when he's talking to them. He just comes right out you know, and says, you know, you know, if I said what you said, I'd be a liar like you. He said, our father's Abraham. They said, our father's Abraham. He said, no, it's not. Your father's the devil. Just come right out and tell them. You tell a lot of people that. Yeah. Your father's the devil. Your father's Satan. Jesus just, he just lambasted them. I, I like that. He just told them the truth, didn't he? Because they need to hear it. But I believe the worst thing that Jesus suffered for you and me was what gave us the greatest of all miracles. What's the greatest miracle there is for human beings? Salvation. Salvation, or the new birth, being born again, isn't it? See, before we're going to experience healing, deliverance, prosperity, and all the rest of the blessings of heaven, we got to get into the kingdom first, don't we? That's right. you got to be born again. you got to become a son or a daughter of God. So we receive the greatest of all miracles because Jesus suffered the worst thing anybody could suffer. And what he suffered was spiritual death. Remember when he hung on the cross and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's when he suffered spiritual death for us. I know uh, back in uh, 1977, when I went to Christ for the Nation's uh, Bible School in Dallas, Texas, when I got there, somebody gave me a tape series by, by Charles Capps. Y'all know who Charles Capps was? He was just a great teacher. He's in heaven now. But he is a great Bible teacher. Um, and, and at the camp meetings, back Brother Kenneth Hagin's camp meetings back in the 70s and 80s, uh, Charles Capps, the guest speakers were normally Kenneth Hagin, uh, Fred Price, Norval Hayes, John Osteen, Charles Capps, and um, I think that's about those about the, the, the main ones that, that taught in those big those camp meetings. They were great camp meetings. Charles Capps was just a, a teacher's teacher, an awesome teacher. And um, somebody I didn't know who he was when they gave me this like a five cassette tape. Y'all a lot of y'all don't know what cassette cassette tapes are. Gave me a five cassette tape series. And um, said, you ought to listen to these. And I said, okay. And, and they said, Charles Capps. And I, first time I ever heard his name. I said, okay, I'll check him out. Well, I put one in my cassette player. And I mean, he, he's talking about, he really talking about Calvary, about, about the mystery of Christ, about Jesus' death and resurrection. And I'm just listening away and enjoying it. I think, man, it's good. It's real good. And as he's, as he's teaching, he says, and Jesus died twice. And I stopped the tape. I thought I misunderstood what he said. So I rewound it, listened to it again, and he said, Jesus died twice when he went to the cross. And I thought, wow, that, that is what he said. Jesus died twice. I thought he only died once. I didn't have a clue what he was talking about here. See, when he said he died twice, I'm just thinking, to me, it's like he's saying he went to the cross two times. He didn't go to the cross two times. He just went once. Because, see, my understanding back then was that Jesus just died. His death was a physical death. And that's so, that's so wrong. And, and, and you'll see why later. If Jesus only had to die physically, then God could have used animals. That's all right. Because, see, we're spirit beings, aren't we? We have a spirit. We possess a soul or mind, and we live in a body. Come on. We're spirit beings. Teach us. So we needed a spiritual sacrifice. See, that's why animals, their, their, their blood shed through their death could not redeem man's spirit, could not cleanse man's conscience. The, the blood of animals could not get, get penetrate through man's body to get down into his spirit. That's right. Because animals could not identify. Remember, if there's no substitution, there could be no identification. That's right. Animals could not identify with us. That's right. Animals don't have a spirit. I, contrary to what a lot of people think. Help us. They don't have a spirit. Amen. See, we have, as humans, we're, we're spirit, soul, and body. And when, and, and when we die physically, our soul is connected to our spirit. And our spirit and soul go straight to heaven. That's right. But animals, they don't have a spirit. They have a mind, but their mind's connected to their body. So when they die, that's it. Oh, you busted bubbles there. <laughs> sure did. Felt it, too. That's it. They don't have a spirit. That's exactly right. Or they need to be saved. Jesus didn't die to, to give eternal life to animals. Animals weren't created in God's image. 
God is a spirit. He created man in his image. And that's why we're spirit beings. Come on. Now, let me, let me uh, help you out here mm. so you don't get all mad at me. You know, I, 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 my, my, I have a dog named, uh, oh, what was my dog's name? <laughs> anyway, I, had, uh, and, uh, and, yeah. and I really loved my dog a lot. I really did. Yeah. And he died a number of years ago. And um, oh, his name was Tango. Uh, Tango. And he died a number of years ago. And of course, I was just as upset as you would have been if your dog or cat or your animal that you love died. And um, I, I, don't, I don't believe um, Tango is in heaven because he doesn't have a spirit. But I do believe it's very possible God made Tango. He can make another one. Yes. He, can, he can create Tango just like he was and have him waiting in heaven for me to greet me when I get there. Because there, the Bible talks about, you know, people talk about going to heaven and seeing animals in heaven. We know they're horses. We're coming back from horses with Jesus. So there, there are animals. So whether, whether it's in your, your, your exact animal, God can make him exactly like he was before. And you would never know the difference if he didn't tell you. True. So I'll give you a little positive side to that for your, for your, for your, for your for hope our lost animals that have, that have left and that have gone. Like human. But see, uh, there had to be an identification. Jesus gave his spirit, soul, mind, and body for us because he had identified with all, all of us was lost. We were all going, our spirit, soul, mind, and body was going, we're all, we, we were all doomed. We're under the curse of the law, weren't we? We needed someone that could identify with our full being and animals could identify with us because we'd be created in God's image and they were not created in God's image. So I believe the worst thing that Jesus suffered was spiritual death. Believe it, I believe that was the worst thing he suffered. And when Charles Capp said Jesus died twice, that just floored me. I, I mean, I came out of a Southern Baptist church. That just floored me. Nobody, I never heard anybody say that. And I didn't know what he meant by that. So I kept on listening. See, I could have been, you know, like a lot of Christians, just turned that off and so I'm not listening to him. See, that's how you don't learn when you don't, you're, 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 so, you're so bound up with how you believe. I'm not going to believe any different than my, my you know, than what they teach in my denomination. Well, you know, what they teach may be unscriptural. You need to go back to the Bible. Yes. Go back to the Bible and believe what the Word of God says. That's right. So I kept on listening, and he talked about how that Jesus died spiritually and he died physically. And he arose spiritually and he arose physically. And if you think about it, that's exactly what Adam did in reverse. And really, Adam died twice, remember? When God told Adam, the day you eat of this fruit, you will die. Sure. Well, that day they didn't die physically. Because he lived to be 930 years old, but he did die. He died spiritually. Then later on, he died physically. Adam died twice, didn't he? Yep. Jesus came as the last Adam, and he died twice. Yep. And he arose from the dead twice. Sure. See, we were dead spiritually. One day, if the rapture doesn't take place, we'll be dead physically. Sure. We, we've already been made alive spiritually and when Jesus comes back for us we'll be made alive physically we'll receive our mortal bodies twice it's twice all the time and what helped me when, when he said that and explained that to me on this text series now this was like 46 years ago when he explained that to me that helped me tremendously because see I never could understand how that a man could just die physically and, and, and free me from spiritual death, free me from sin, which is spiritual. See, sin is not physical. The results can be physical, but you don't bear, you know, the sin of adultery in your left knee and then the sin of stealing in your right knee. Sin is spiritual. Calvary ultimately was a spiritual sacrifice. You need to, re you need to remember that. It was mainly a spiritual sacrifice. Jesus, Jesus gave his spirit man. He received all the curse and everything into his spirit. And then, and then the manifestation of that spread everywhere else in his body. And isn't that what happened to us? When we, when we were lost, when Adam and Eve died spiritually, the nature of sin and death, the law of sin and death came into the spirit. And the results of that is sickness, disease, poverty, lack, all that ended up in the rest of every area of their lives. So think of, so Calvary was a spiritual sacrifice. Because, see, I never could understand how well, a man could give his, just his physical body, and, and that affected my spirit, soul, mind, my finances, and everything else. It didn't make sense. 
In other words, there was no substitution identification there. But when, when I heard him teach on that, man, that, that really, that opened up my spiritual eyes. And I thought, wow, this makes better sense now. Now I can see how Jesus can set me free in all these areas of my life because he gave his whole being for me, not just in part. <coughs> that makes sense, y'all? Mm -hmm. that, that made a lot of sense to me when I thought about it. So Calvary was a spiritual sacrifice. Now, turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at, let's look at some scriptures here. Colossians chapter 1, let's start with verse 15. I, I want to read several verses here. It says, who is the image, of course, this is talking about the Lord Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Say firstborn. firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Consist means all things, he holds up, he holds everything together. You know, God was, were to remove his hand off the universe and all the planets, they'd all, who knows what, they just all fall apart probably. Look at verse 18. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Say the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead. That's an important phrase there. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. The firstborn from the dead. Now, turn over to Revelation chapter 1 real quick. Let me give you one more verse that uses that phrase. Go over to Revelation chapter 1. And look at verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the firstborn, first begotten of the dead, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the Bible refers to Jesus as the firstborn or the first begotten from the dead. Now, I, I, I was looking in uh, one, uh, reading some notes from one, uh, uh, I guess, commentary, and he said that that phrase, the first begotten from the dead, that's just a phrase of greatness. That just tells us how great the Lord was. Well, that doesn't even make sense. Does that sound normal to you? Does that make sense to you? It's a phrase of greatness. If I say Pastor Danny's the firstborn from the dead, you're not going to think, wow, he's really a great person. How's greatness have to do with that? That's just people trying to come up with an excuse because they don't understand what they're talking about. But you know, I, my, in, in my family, I don't have any sisters. I have a brother. He's my younger brother, about a year or two much younger than me. And uh, so I'm the firstborn. But my parents, my mom has never told anybody that Dwayne is my firstborn from the dead. <laughs> Do you know any mothers that ever describe their firstborn as the first begotten of the dead? No. That sounds gruesome, doesn't it? If you said that, if you said, yeah, this is my daughter, she's our, she's our firstborn from the dead. They'd say, what? Firstborn from the dead? Who uses that? Nobody says that. You just say, this is our firstborn. This is our secondborn. This is our thirdborn. But nobody calls their firstborn the firstborn from the dead. So see, when the, when the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead, it literally means that. Yeah. yeah. Now, he wasn't the firstborn from physical death. A lot of people have been, been, been raised from physical death. In the Old Testament, Jesus raised several people from the dead physically. See, Jesus wasn't the firstborn from physical death. But he was the firstborn from spiritual death. That's right. Uh... He was the firstborn. Jesus was the first person to experience the born again, new birth experience. He was the first person to experience. Then our number's in there somewhere else. I don't know where mine is. I might be, who knows, you know, 50, the 50 billionth one or something. I don't know. Maybe God will tell us what our number is. I bet I know who's first, though. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Now, over in, um, turn over to first. I, want, I better let you look at these. Turn over to first, first Corinthians chapter fifteen now. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Let me show you another place where it uses this phrase here, real quick. Chapter fifteen, and look at verse twenty. It says, "But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept." He's become the first fruits 
of them that slept. He's the first fruits. Now that word, that word firstborn or first fruits in the Greek in which this was written is uh, the word uh, prototokos. And I don't know if that's correct, so all you Greek scholars, uh, don't get mad at me. I, I, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read a concordance, so. But I, I don't always know how to pronounce it. But that word firstborn, it means beginning. It means first in place or origin, first in time. Beginning, first in place or origin. First in a series, which, which implies others are, are going to follow that. And, they, and that's, that's talking about us now. Yeah. But Jesus was the prototype. He was the first born from the dead. I remember back then, uh, back in uh, oh, the 70s and 80s when we had cassette tapes. I had a, a cassette duplicator that duplicated three, three cassette tapes at a time. But I had, I had the, the main tape I put a, a, over here to the side. Then I put three blank tapes on there. And, you know, it took about, I guess, three or four minutes. But it would duplicate them all. It was, uh, but the, the main tape was the first in the series. That's kind of what God did with us. Spiritually speaking, so to speak, Jesus was the, he was, he was the, the main tape. And we were all the blank tapes. And when we believed on Jesus, then we got duplicated, so to speak. We all got born again. But Jesus, God had to have a prototype, though. See, God had to have somebody that's experienced the new birth. So, so basically, you could say that he could make us off that prototype. That's right. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so Jesus had to do what he, what he did. He had to suffer spiritual death. He had to go through what was absolutely agonizing to him. So we could be here today. So we could be sons and daughters of God. Right. And you know, when I think about Jesus... Um, and what he went through, I, remember who Jesus was and who he is. He's Almighty God, isn't he? Before he came to this earth, there's only one God, God, God Almighty, and he manifests himself as the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. See, all three are God, but they're not three different gods. See, they're not three different gods. They're one God, but every one is deity. But before Jesus came and, 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 and took on a fleshly body on this earth 2,000 years ago, remember, God is eternal. He's the self-existent one. God's the only being that, that, that existed throughout eternity past. See, we're eternal beings. The devil's an eternal being. We're all going to exist forever, spiritually speaking. But nobody, nobody has existed through eternity past except God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So think about that before Jesus came to this earth and went to the cross for us. He was with God for eternity past. We can't even fathom how long that was. Because God has no beginning. It's hard to even, when you use the word infinity, it's like it goes in this ear and out this and this ear. Because we like to be able to say it starts here and it finishes here. We always have beginnings and ends, you know. Start here, finish here. Start here, start preaching at 8 o'clock, finish at 9 o'clock, you know. And God, 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 there's no time with God. God always was. So think about that. Jesus always was God. He was always one, one with God. So when Jesus came to the earth, when he went to the cross and bore our, 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 our nature of sin and death or spiritual death, he had never ever experienced that before. Think about that. For eternity past, he had never experienced being separated from God, from the Father. See, we can't even fathom what, 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 what Jesus felt. We just know he cried out. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a big deal for Jesus. Why have you forsaken me? After being with God in perfect fellowship for eternity past, now God turned his back on Jesus because of what Jesus was doing for us. So see, what I'm teaching on, when I teach on the mystery of Christ and what we've been talking about for the last uh, uh, you know, couple of months now, I'm really teaching on, uh, I'm really talking to you about the love of God. Because the more I think about what Jesus suffered for me, especially spiritual death, he allowed himself to be separated from the Father that he never experienced in eternity past. He did that so I would never have to be separated from the Father again. Amen. Wow. When I think about that, it makes me stop and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. You, you must really love me. You must love me a lot. So the mystery of Christ is really a revelation of the love of God. You know, I, in my book on the mystery, if you don't have it, you ought to get it. 
But uh, I have five chapters in that book uh, called God's Greatest Demonstration of Love for Man. And that's what I'm talking about, about Jesus' very spiritual death. God, I believe that was God's greatest demonstration of love that Jesus showed to, to humanity. And I actually, if you go to my YouTube channel, I have six messages, six video messages on it called God's Greatest Demonstration of Love for Man, parts one through six. They're only about like 25 minutes a piece. Where I'm teaching, I'm specifically teaching on that. If, if, if you want to want to have something on, on videotape, you can go back and watch it. You can get the book, read the book, but you can go back and watch it on that. God's greatest demonstration of love for man. That's why it's so important. But you know, a lot of people, there are a lot of ministers in the world today, a lot of Christians. Man, they don't like it if you say Jesus for spiritual death. They don't like that at all. That, they, they don't like that. They, 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 they don't want to believe Jesus did that. They don't want to believe Jesus went to hell. If he didn't, we would have had to go. Remember, if there's no substitution, there can be no identification. If you want to be identified with Jesus and go to heaven, then somebody's got to substitute for you and go to hell in your place. And Jesus did that for us. Where do the people that are spiritually dead go? They go to hell. That's where Jesus went for us. But a lot of people, a lot of ministers, they remind me of Peter. Remember when, when Jesus was telling Peter, you know, i got to die and rise from the dead. I'm going to suffer a lot. And what, remember Peter rebuked Jesus? He said, oh, no, not you. No. You know, not my sweet Jesus. He, he didn't want to believe in, that he could go through some such agony and, and torture and suffer, and suffer that way. That's why a lot of Christians are today. When you start talking about what Jesus really suffered for you, they'll say, not my sweet Jesus. Well, you've got to realize that Jesus, you know, he was the, the sinless lamb of God when he went to the cross. There's a message I never had preached, but I always had this a title for it. I was going to call it the lamb, the serpent, and the lion. The lamb, the serpent, and the lion. When Jesus went to the cross, he was the sinless lamb of God. But once they nailed him to the cross, he became the serpent on the pole. He said so himself. Jesus said so himself in the Bible in John chapter 3. He became the serpent on the pole that was back in the Old Testament. He became the serpent on the pole. Now, a lot of Christians say they think, no, what the how, how could you call him? How could you use the analogy that Jesus was a serpent? That's an analogy for the devil, isn't it? It sure is. Because he became a curse for us. And a lot of Christians, haven't, they haven't had any teaching along this line. They just think he was a sinless lamb of God. He just this sweet lamb and just, he just went to the cross and and they had a couple of grips of blood gripped out of his hand, you know. They, you know, there were naked babies flying over his head while he hung there, and uh, singing hallelujah. And, and 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 then he died. And they just tried to they tried to keep it real sweet and clean and and just so lovely and sweet. It wasn't lovely. It wasn't sweet. It was hell. That's right. Jesus suffered undescribable torture and agony and 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 just things so horrible we can't imagine. You remember that movie, The Passion, that Mel Gibson put out? I mean, I thought he did a pretty good job trying to show what Jesus suffered physically. But he still didn't really, he still didn't cover it. Like, he could, they'd have to rate a triple X. Because it was so not, not for, not for uh, bad stuff. Because they'd have to try to show all the suffering Jesus went through. Right. And all the blood that he shed. And that was just physically what you saw in The Passion movie. See, he couldn't, yeah, nobody could show, make a movie to show what he suffered when he went to hell, what he uh, suffered spiritually. Exactly. We don't even have that fully described in the Bible. We don't even know ourselves what all he went through in hell. That would have been worse than what he went through on the earth. So see, what you want to do sometimes is just take time, like, like I'm kind of bringing this out right now, sometimes sit down and just take time to think about this again. And after you think about it for a while, you might drop to your knees and say, God, I really love you. Lord Jesus, you love me so much. Wow. When I really think about what you went through, so you could be the firstborn, so you could, so you could be the, the master cassette tape, so God could go ahead and start duplicating. What you went through to do that, so what you went through to become the firstborn, and that's why the Bible calls them the firstborn from the dead. Jesus was the first person that, that was born again from spiritual death to spiritual life. And the neat thing about that, Jesus was born again in hell. Yeah. 
What a slap in the devil's face. What a slap in the devil's face. If Jesus can be born again in the pit of hell and the devil couldn't stop it, there's nothing he can, he can stop you from doing on the earth. Come on. He was born again in hell. Somebody got saved in hell. Wow. That will never happen again. Nope. That was just a one-time event there. Sure. After Jesus paid our penalty for sin, the Spirit of God came into hell and quickened his spirit. Made him born again. And then, of course, you, we'll get into that later. He conquered all the hell and came out of there and went over to paradise. Got Abraham and the Old Testament saints in paradise itself and took them all to heaven. Sure. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Let me read you, let me read you some stuff here. The word firstborn means first, it means first, or, or it means to beget, to beget, to be, to, it means to be born of. But listen to it out of the, the, this one uh, theologian, his name is Vincent. He, he, he describes it this way. He says, Christ is the beginning of the new spiritual life of the church. He comes forth among, from among the dead as the firstborn issues from the womb. Then you got the scripture over in Acts 2, 24. You don't need to turn to it. But it talks about how Jesus was delivered from the pangs. In the King James Bible, it uses the word pangs. P-A-N-G-S means pain. It's the same as P-A-I-N. But Jesus was delivered from the, from, from, he had birth pains. He, he, he was delivered from the pain, pains of death. A lot of times Christians, they read that verse and just go on to the next verse. But see, you need to think about that. Jesus was delivered from, he, from the pains of death. I didn't know there's pain in death. I mean, if somebody dies right now, if somebody fell over dead right now on the floor, we would say, boy, they must be in a lot of pain. <laughs> no, they may be in pain while they're dying. But if a person's dead, they're not in any pain. But the Bible says Jesus was delivered from the pains of death. There's no pains in being physically dead. You know, you go out to the grave, it says R.I.P. You know, rest in peace. You don't go out to a graveyard and say, boy, these people got to be in a lot of pain right now. Now, they may be spiritually in pain because they're in hell. Some of them might be there, but I'm talking about physically. You don't go out to the graveyard and say, boy, these people are in a lot of physical pain right now. If I said that, you'd say, Dwayne, they're dead. If you're dead, you're not in any pain at all. But it says Jesus was delivered from the, from the pains of death. So obviously, he must be talking about a different kind of death there. It wasn't the pains of physical death, it's the pains of spiritual death. That's exactly right. Because there is pain in spiritual death. Come on. He bore spiritual death for us. He was delivered from the pains of death. Now, let me read a couple of translations to you on that. The 20th century translation says, being the first to be born again from the dead. This is Colossians 1, 18, where it calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. The Knox translation says, Jesus too is that head whose body is the church. It begins with him since he was the first birth out of death. The first birth out of death. I like the way he says that. The Weymouth translation says, the first of the dead to be born to life. First of the dead to be born to life. That's why I like to look at different translations. I mainly read the study out of the King James Bible and New King James, like Paul did, you know. And... Uh, he did. Y'all didn't laugh on that. He, he didn't have the King James Bible. <laughs> King James wasn't even born yet. That's exactly right. But, uh, but I, I like using other translations. I get a kick out of these people on Facebook. They, you know, King James only. We're the King James only group. King James Bible has mistakes in it too. That's exactly right. It's just, in my opinion... It's just, it's just the, the best of all translations. It's not as many mistakes as other translations. The King James Bible was originally King James commissioned uh, the, 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 the translation of the Bible into English. He, he, what he was doing was his job was to take it out of, the, out of the Hebrew and Greek and put it into English, not to translate it. See, a lot of translations now, they're, they're trying to give you their, what, what they believe about it. They're trying to give you their interpretation of that verse. That's why a lot of translations are really messed up. I got about, I guess, about 50 translations. I like, I like, I like looking at translations like these, just to see what they say. Sometimes they'll be real squirrely. Sometimes they'll really shed some good light on it and give you understanding. But then I go back to my King James Bible and see what it says. But the way translation says it this way: He, Jesus, was the firstborn of the dead to be born to new life. 
The Dolan translation, listen to this. It, it says, for the word, for that phrase, the firstborn from the dead, Jesus, he calls it, Jesus was the pioneer of the resurrection. That's pretty neat, isn't it? He was the pioneer. He pioneered the resurrection. He was the pioneer of the resurrection. What's that mean? Well, he was the first person resurrected. Not physically. A lot of people have been resurrected from the dead. Like I said, before Jesus ever was. But nobody had ever been resurrected spiritually. That's from right. spiritual death to spiritual life. That's all right. Nobody was. 20th century translation says he was the firstborn of the dead to be born again. And another translation says he was the firstborn of the dead. To be born, of course, you know, to be born again or to be born to new life. So if anybody ever says, if you ever ask somebody, you know, is that your firstborn? They say, yeah, that's my firstborn from the dead. Then you might want to question them on that and say, oh, so they've been born again then. But nobody uses that phrase, do they? Nobody uses that phrase ever. They never use that phrase. Now, I want us to look at something else here. Turn over to, uh, to, to the book of, uh, well, turn over first to Psalms real quick. There's a verse over here, Psalm chapter 2, the second chapter of Psalm. You've heard this before. Look at verse 7. It says, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, You are my son, this day have I begotten thee. You've heard that phrase, haven't you? You are my son this day. I'm emphasizing this day. What day was he talking about? This day have I, be, have I begotten thee. Remember, begotten means to give birth to. You know, most people would think when it says this day have I begotten you, I, I would almost guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of Christians and ministers, if you ask them what day was he talking about when it says this day have I begotten you, they would immediately say, well, that's when Mary gave birth to him. But we have God, God actually gives us his own commentary that that's not the day he's referring to here. Actually, get, we got a commentary from God. We don't need anybody else's translation. So now go over to Acts 13. Go over to Acts chapter 13. Let me show you what Paul said over here. Paul was preaching over here in Acts chapter 13. And look what he said over here. Look at verse 33 now. Look at verse 33. He said, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Paul is actually quoting Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, This day have I begotten thee. But he's connected it to the resurrection. You hear, see that? Look at it again. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. Raised him up again? Well, the first time he was raised up was when he was born of the Virgin Mary. That's when he was right. raised up on, on, on this earth uh, to, to go to the cross. This says when he was raised up again. So this, this obviously again refers to a, another time, right? Yes. At least the second time. Yes. When he was raised up again. And then and if, and if you ask Paul, well, Paul, you know, what, what reference do you have from the scriptures that prove that? He would say Psalm 2 verse 7. And you would say, well, I thought that's when, when he was born of the Virgin Mary. No. No, when God, when God begot him, raised him, when he was begotten on that day, he's talking about the day of his resurrection. When he is born from spiritual death to spiritual life. Y'all see that there? See, so you need to understand, understand these verses. Now, let me give you, I want to give you several verses here. Turn over to Isaiah. This is, a, this is a really good one over here. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Now, this, this, this chapter is just a great chapter about healing, about, about Jesus' um, atonement for us. But I want you to look at verse 9 here. The whole chapter is talking about Jesus. Isaiah is prophesying about 700 years before Jesus went to the cross. Verse 9, though. Now, listen. He said, and he talked about Jesus. He made his grave with the wicked. Now, now think about that. 
He made his grave with the wicked. Are you thinking? If Pastor Danny fell over dead right now, he's not going to. If he fell over dead right now, if I said, I'm going to let Pastor Danny make his grave with it, with his other relatives that have already died and gone to heaven. Does that make sense to you? You'd say, he's dead. How can he make his grave? How can a dead person make his grave? If Danny fell over dead, we, we wouldn't say, well, just wait a minute. He's going to get up and go dig a hole and bury himself. <laughs> no, he's dead. A dead person can't make their own grave, can they? No. Well, what's it say again? And Come Jesus on. made his grave with the wicked. Come on. Well, that's how do you do that? You can't do it physically, can you? You can't do it spiritually. He made his grave. He went to where the wicked, those that are spiritually dead go. That's exactly right. Which is hell, isn't it? That's it. He made his grave with the wicked. Good teach. And he made his grave with the wicked. Now listen to this part. And with the rich in his death. Now that's, I'm reading out the King James Bible. Now the Hebrew word for death there that you want, it's hard to find it. Because a lot of translations will not put it in there. The Hebrew word for death is plural. Plural. It shouldn't say he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his deaths. In his deaths. Because he died two times. Two times. He died twice, didn't he? He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his deaths. Now, some trend, I, one, one translation, I don't, it's not this one I have, it has a little footnote by the word where it says that he made his grave with the wicked. Obviously, the translators didn't understand how can a dead man make his grave. If it's just physical death. So they put a footnote there. And like a little one by the word he. And over over, over in the margin of my Bible. It, it, they, they, they put the word they. Well really no they did it reverse. In that translation I was reading it says. And they made his grave with the wicked. And there was a, there was a little one by the word they. And over, in the, over in, the, in the margin. It says. The Hebrew is he. And you think well why didn't you put that? You're mistranslating the scriptures. Why didn't you put that in there? Because they don't, they don't. See, that's the problem. If you're going to make a translation, a new translation out of the Bible, don't put your interpretation in there. You simply translate what the Bible says, even if you don't understand it. And you know, if you're if you're just straight Baptist, then you're gonna you're, you're gonna probably leave out a lot of stuff in the Bible. If you're Catholic or Methodist. You're going to leave out stuff. See, don't translate the Bible based on your understanding. Just put what the Greek says, whether you understand it or not. Put what the Hebrew says, whether you understand it or not. And that's what a lot of these translations do. They don't put what the Greek and Hebrew says. A lot of them put what they think it's supposed to say. That's right. But I just thought it was amazing. In the Bible I was looking at, it actually says, they translated it, they made his grave with the wicked. And the translation, in the translation, they actually bring out the point that this is not correct. Isn't that stupid? Yeah. This is not correct. You should say, hey. You want to say, well, then why didn't you? You know, you want to slap somebody. You want to say, well, then why didn't you put the correct translation? Because that doesn't make sense to them, see? Because they read that and thought, how can a dead man make his grave? Well, he can't physically. And if you don't know Jesus died twice, then that would not. If you read that, yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? Makes sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. It says he made his grave with the wicked because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now, let me read you a commentary. This is a commentary called the Jameson Fawcett Brown Commentary that I have on my bookshelf. I looked it up in this commentary, and he said in his commentary, he said the Hebrew word for death there is deaths, D-E-A-T-H-S, plural. And here's, here's his, I, I, I got a little paragraph. Here's what he said. He said the plural deaths intensifies the force. As, he, as Genesis says, as Adam by, by sin dying, died. Remember God told Adam, the day you eat of it, in dying you will die. He said, he said as Adam by sin dying, died, he incurred death physical and spiritual. See, obviously this guy, he, he, he recognized that. It was a spiritual death and a physical death. He said, so Messiah, his substitute, endured death in both senses, spiritual during his temporary abandonment by the Father, when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And physically, when he gave up the ghost. Sure. 
Praise God. So the Bible tells us that Jesus died twice. He died two deaths. Now that makes sense when you read it. The whole Bible makes better sense when you have a revelation of, the, of how Jesus died. That he died spiritually and physically and arose spiritually and physically. You know, I got to think one day about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he's in the garden. And, and you know, he's, I mean, he's about, to, he's about to take on the sin of the world. And he's, he's sweating drops of blood, isn't he? And he's praying, to, he's praying to see if he can get out of doing it. He's praying if he can get at God, if there's any other way, Father. You know, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm you know, not, you know, not my will be done but yours. But if there's, a, you know, if there's an alternate plan, you got to plan B or C or D or anything beside this plan. You know, I, you know, I, I, I'm open to suggestions, Father. And God let him know, no, this is this is the plan. Now, if if Jesus was sweating drops of blood, he was in that kind of agony. Where he's sweating drops of blood just because he's going to die physically. It seems like he didn't, he didn't have as much courage as Stephen did in the book of Acts. He was the first martyr of the church. Remember Stephen? Acts chapter 7. He just stood there, you know, let me. He preached the message and then they started stoning him. You know, he didn't say, oh God, if there's a way to get out of this, let me get out of it. No, he just stood there and he looked up to heaven, saw Jesus stand up for the first martyr of the church. And they just stoned him to death. He didn't try to get out of it. He didn't say, God, help me. You know, there's another plan. No. But Jesus over in the garden, he's sweating blood. Saying, God, there's follows another way to get out of this. If he was doing that just because of physical death, no. Not in, not in any way. Jesus knew what he was about to do. See, I cannot imagine taking on the sins and the wickedness and the evil of all of humanity. I can't even grasp the, the enormity of what that means. But think about that. You'd be sweating blood too. You'd be saying, Father, I hate to bring this up, but is there a plan B here? I know, I'm, I know what I'm about to do here. If, if, if I go on through with your plan here, I'm going to be separated from you. I'm going, to be, I'm going to take on the nature of Satan in my own spirit. And I'm going to go to hell. And, I, and, and they're going to be able to torture me for who, now, who knows how long until... I can satisfy your laws of justice and you can raise me from the dead. He knew what, what he's about to do. Is, is it any wonder he has sweat and drops of blood? Because yeah. he knew. I'm not just dying physically. That was bad. But that, that was in one sense, you know, a piece of cake to die spiritually. Wow, praise God. Praise God. Turn over to Matthew chapter 12 with me real quick. My three hours up yet. Not twice. Turn over, yeah, go over to Matthew chapter 12. And I uh, want to give you some more uh, proofs here. That's really what I'm doing, giving you proofs from the Bible. So you can, you can show from Scripture what Jesus did for us. Matthew chapter 12, and look at verse um, look at verse 40. This is in red in my Bible. The Lord Jesus said this. He said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, he just told us where hell is. Yep. Hell is in the heart of the earth. Yep. That's where it is. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, what, what some people will say, back in, before Jesus went to, went, uh, rose from the dead and, and went to heaven, back then, the, the Hebrew word for hell is Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, Sheol, the Greek word is Hades. But hell back then what, had, had at least two compartments. One compartment was called the, the place of torments, what we call hell. And then the other compartment was, was, was a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And it was separated by a great gulf. You can read that in Luke chapter 16 where it talks about the rich man member that went down to, went down to paradise. And, and uh, no, the, the beggar went down to paradise, the rich man went to hell. And then the rich man was in, in hell itself, in the place of torments. And he could actually see 
the, the beggar in Abraham's bosom over there across that gulf. He said, well, he said, Father Abraham, would you send him over here? This is a conversation he's having down in, in the center of the earth. Would you send him over here and with a little water to cool my tongue? And there's so much teaching from this because it talks about how you can feel things down there. And he had a tongue. I mean, we, there's, a, there's a whole other teaching on, on all that right there Smooth. that we don't have time to get into. But back then, there was, a, there was paradise. All the Old Testament saints were down there because nobody could go to heaven until they got born again. And then there was a, the place of torments, which was hell. So when Jesus, when Jesus describes this, he says, my experience in my death, he talks about, I'm gonna, you know, uh, let's read that again, where he, where he talks about the three, three days here. Go back. Let me go back over there. 1240. For his Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly. Isn't that interesting? Jesus was three days and three nights, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Three days and three nights in the well's belly. And some say, well, you know, that, that might not have been as bad as it sounded, you know. <laughs> some people you just want to laugh at them. You want to say, you got to come up with a list of, at least some more lot better logical arguments than that. That just sounds like a three-year-old there. You don't even, don't even want to respond to that kind of dumb talk. It might not have been as bad. To be in a well's belly for three days and three nights, I don't, that doesn't sound very good to me. But Jesus describes his experience in hell. He compares it to Jonah's experience in the belly of a well or a great fish. He said, my experience is going to be like Jonah's. Well, let's go see what Jonah's experience was like. Turn over to Jonah. Let's go over here to, to, to Jonah over here. You know where Jonah is, going like to Daniel, which is like after Ezekiel, and go to the, you turn to the right, and Hosea, and Obadiah, and you get over to Jonah here. But turn over to Jonah, and, I, and let's look at a couple of scriptures over here real quick. Jonah chapter 1. Tell me when y'all find that. It's, in, it's on page 1101 in my Bible. You can't find it, just go to the, con, go to the, front, the front of the, the Bible and look it up. Jonah. Y'all got Jonah? I see everybody. Everybody's turning pages here. The book of Jonah. Let me read a couple of things here. You got Hosea. Maybe hit some of these. You got Hosea. Then you got Joel. Then you got Amos. And then you have Obadiah. Then you have Jonah. And let's see, after Jonah is Micah. And after Micah is Haggai or Haggai. Y'all almost there? <coughs> That's why we have Bible school. <laughs> Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. Jonah chapter 1, and uh, let's look at verse 17 here. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then chapter 2 here. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now try to think about what you're reading here. He's inside of a fish's stomach. And he's not dead. He's, had, he's praying. Praying inside. I've never prayed inside a fish's belly before. He was praying, he was praying inside of a fish's stomach. And, and it says, and said... I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. Well, that doesn't sound like a paradise experience, does it? No. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and you heard my voice. For you have cast me into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and the floods compass me about. All thy billows and thy waves pass over me. Then said I, then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. This sounds disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Verse 6. Jonah said, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Sounds like just, just bondage. Yet hast thou brought, me, brought my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Now, I want to read to you 
I got a couple of translations here. Here, the Good News Bible says it this way. Jonah said, I went down to the very roots of the mountains and to the land whose gates lock shut forever. But you, O oh Lord my God, brought me back from the depth of life. Sound like Jonah had a hellish experience. A horrible experience. The basic English Bible says, you have taken up my life from the underworld, O oh Lord my God. Wow, you have taken up my life from the underworld. Then uh, the, the New American uh, Bible says, the abyss enveloped me. Hell is referred to as the abyss. The abyss enveloped me. Jesus said, I'm going to have an experience like Jonah. So where did Jesus go? So you see, again, a lot of ministers say, oh, he definitely didn't go to the torments or hell. He went over to paradise, you know. And, uh, you know, he, uh, what, what did he do? Just kind of play Monopoly for three days and three nights till God wrote you said, you need to come on back up? No, no. He went to torments. And he stayed, he was tortured by the devil and the demons of hell. But see, they thought they had Jesus. That's why the Bible says if the devil knew what God's plan was, he would have never done it. But God plays chess better than the devil. See, the devil didn't understand that when Jesus went to the cross, he we went as a sinless lamb. He became, see, he became the serpent on the pole. He became our sin, though. But see, he never committed sin. If he had committed any sin, then he could have, the devil would have kept him down there. But he never committed sin. He, he, he became our sin. And because he became our sin, the devil didn't have a legal right to keep him down there. God had a legal right to raise him from the dead. But God wasn't going to raise him from the dead until he could declare us righteous. I believe that's why the three days and three nights, God knew, God knew how long it would take for Jesus to accomplish and suffer what he needed to suffer until God, could, God, God in heaven could say, Now I can declare all, all the humanity righteous. That means now somebody's going to get born again. And he said, Holy Spirit, go on down there. And you quicken his spirit. And you make him alive right now, right there in hell. And man, I, I, I would like God to show me that when I get to heaven. Because I want to see what that looked like when he was born again. I want to see the, the, the devil's face, the demon's faces. I want to see what happened when all of a sudden the life of God entered his spirit. I mean, you know, and, and basically he became Superman again. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see what that looks like. The devil thought he didn't like it a bit. But see, we need to understand that Jesus did go to hell. Let me share a few more scriptures with you, and I won't go much longer. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. Pat, your pastor told me I'd go as long as I want. Amen. I won't go, I won't go real long, though. Ephesians chapter, but I want to get, I want, to, I want you to get, get, get this. Ephesians chapter 4. Because I'm looking at some scriptures that you've probably read before, but you never thought about it in the light of what we're talking about tonight. That's why the next time you go, you go, you read these scriptures again, they're going to be more to you. You're going to understand them a lot better. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 9. Well, let's start verse 8. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, talking about Jesus now. Remember, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, talking about when he ascended into heaven. Remember, he took paradise and all the Old Testament saints into heaven. So now paradise that was in hell is now in heaven. And we know that because over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul talks about the thorn, remember he says, I know a man that, that, was, that went, up to, went up to paradise. Went up to paradise, not down to paradise. So paradise has been taken to heaven. Heaven, heaven is, is, is paradise. That's where Abraham's bosom is now. So it says here that he made captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now listen to verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Now this is important. Notice it said that he descended first. Say first. First. See, when you got people that they'll say Jesus definitely didn't go to hell. As soon as he died on the cross, you know, he just right, right then he went straight to heaven. He ascended. Well, hold, let's read this again. It says, now that he ascended, he did ascend, but what? What is it but that he also descend, descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's where hell is. He didn't first ascend. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't go to heaven. He went right down into, into the place of torments. He went into hell. He descended first. You see that there? He descended first. Now, turn over to Romans chapter 10. I'm getting you looking up scriptures now. 
Romans chapter 10. I want you to look at this verse over here. You've read it before, but you may not have thought about it this way. Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 6 and 7 here. It says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Or who shall descend into the deep? Now if you look up that word deep in just a strong concordance because it was originally written in Greek. That, that the Greek word for deep there is, a, is abusos. A-B-U-S-S-O-S. Abusos or abyss. The abyss. So, so the Greek word for deep is, all, is abusos and it's also the word abyss. Okay? And, and the abusos or abyss describes an immeasurable depth. It describes the underworld, the lower regions. It describes the abyss of Sheol, which is the Hebrew word for hell. So verse 7 in Romans chapter 10 tells us that Jesus descended into hell itself right there. Now over Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8 verse 31, you don't, you don't need to turn to it. That's, that's the story of where uh, uh, the, the um, madman of, of the Gadarenes came out. You know, that had like a legion of demons in it. Remember that? And the demons spoke, you know, Jesus told them to come out and the demons said, well, if you're going to cast us out, see, they already knew they had to go. He said, and they said, you're going to cast us out, we, uh, you know, uh, you know, they said, don't cast us into the deep. Cast us into those pigs over there. They didn't want to go to the deep. See, even the demons don't want to go to hell. Yeah. Come on. It's good. <laughs> they don't like hell either. <laughs> They don't want to go to hell. And just let me give a side thought here. I was listening, uh, uh, reading many years ago. I think it was a book by a man that had been to hell, and and God and in this and God was showing him the different um, rankings of demons in hell, because the devil has rankings just like a military has rankings, and and and, and God showed him all these different demons are all, they're all ugly, they're all evil and wicked and perverted, you know. But then God showed him the, the demon spirit of homosexuality and lesbianism. And he showed him that the other demons, they, they, they hated that demon. They thought that was disgusting. These are demons. And they didn't like the demon of homosexuality at all. That's what the Lord showed him in this vision that he gave him. I thought that was real interesting. And how, how bad that homosexual spirit is, even the demons. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that demon, and they're all they're all the same family. So they don't want to be cast into the deep. The use of the word deep there, the word deep there in the Greek is the abyss, the lower region or the abode of darkness. That, that in other words, I'm, I'm bringing that out to, to show you again, scripturally show you, Jesus went to torments. He went to hell. He didn't just go to paradise. He went to hell first to pay our penalty for sin. Then over to Revelation. And you don't need to turn to this. Over Revelation talks about oh uh, uh, about the beast and, and the antichrist and, and, and coming up out of it talks about them coming up out of the pit. Well, the pit is that that's another word for the abyss and for the deep, talking about hell. That that's what it's about. And what I wrote here is, is this: it talks about the beast that sins out of the pit. The beast referred to the antichrist. One, one a theologian named Thayer, he said that that Greek word there is a pit, it's a cistern, it's a well, it's the pit of the abyss. He said, because the nether world is thought to increase in size, the further it extends from the surface of the earth, and so to resemble a cistern, an orifice of which is narrow. Did you know that? It's thought that hell, as it get, goes deeper in the earth, it gets bigger. To hold the people. Hell's a real place. Yeah. You don't want to go there. The way to avoid hell, and for you watching on the internet, is to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. When you do that, you just got out of hell. Just like that. You're out of it. You're, you're done with hell. You're, you're born again now. You're now in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light. Nobody should want to go to hell. That's why, and, you know, I've done a lot of witnessing and, and out on the street and, and people would say, well, if I go to hell, I'll just play pool with my friends. You know, just dumb talk like that. They want to say, 
You don't know what you don't have a clue what's going on here. You're not going to play pool with anybody. One of the one of the one of the sufferings of hell is you don't get you don't have any fellowship with anybody down there. That's, right. That's the whole point. It's darkness for eternal, forever, forever. Now, over in, in Luke chapter twenty-three, and I'll close with this verse. Turn to Luke twenty-three. Y'all still awake? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I hope you're learning something. We're having Bible school tonight. Luke chapter 23. And I want you to look at verse uh, verse 43 here. This is another good verse that people will use. They think it proves Jesus did not go to torments in hell. But they think he went to paradise. Remember with the, with the, when he was crucified on the cross, there was a thief on either side of him? And I, I want to read this part here. The one thing said this, he's in verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wow. Remember when you come into your kingdom. Because I keep turning my mouth down like that. Remember when you come into your kingdom. Now look at verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, you'll get a lot of translations. They'll, 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 they, like in my, in my King James Bible, says, I say unto thee, comma, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Trying to emphasize that he went to paradise, that the thief was going there, and of course Jesus said, you'll be with me there. So he is going there right then. You've got to realize, the comma I have in my Bible, in the Greek, there's no punctuation, first of all. So somebody had to put the comma in here. The translators had to put a comma. See, they, the translators put... Put punctuation where they thought it needed punctuation. Mm -hmm. It's good. So they read this and thought, well, no, I know my Jesus didn't go to hell, not my sweet Jesus. No, he didn't go to hell. No, that's like that's, again, that's Peter. No, you're not going to go, you're not going to be get killed, Jesus. And Jesus, remember what Jesus told him? What did Jesus think about that? He called him Satan, didn't he? Yeah. That's pretty strong talk. Yeah. So, I've never told somebody that. that I, they said something I didn't agree with. I never said, Satan, get behind me. Man, that, that was... I'll probably lose my friend. <laughs> I never called him by that. <gasps> Jesus, Peter just confessed Jesus as the Christ. A little while later, Jesus rebuked him and called him the devil. Because, see, Jesus knew what he was about to do was extremely important. If he didn't do what Peter, if, if, if he did what Peter said and didn't, didn't die and rise from the dead, all of humanity would be in hell. See, Peter didn't, they didn't have a revelation of this back then. They just thought we're losing Jesus. He's sweet and wonderful and nice and heals people, delivers people. Now he's talking about all this torture and all this horrible stuff he's going to do. That's why Peter thought, well, no, no. He thought he's being, he, he thought he's doing, you know, probably saying the right thing. No, you're my friend. No, you're sweet. You're the lamb. You're the sinless lamb. Basically, Jesus said, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you just don't understand what, what, what I have to do. But you will later. You will later. So Jesus said, I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now, there's two ways that, that can go. You have, to, you have to decide based on your understanding of the scriptures. If Jesus said, if he said to the man, the, to the thief on the cross, if he said, if he said, um, I'm going to paradise today and you'll be with me. Well, that doesn't agree with all the other scriptures that we looked at tonight, does it? Remember, the way to interpret the Word of God is with the Word. The Word of God has to agree. See, if you get a, if you if you, if you come to me and you, you you say God gave me a great sermon to preach, I got a great revelation last night, and 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 I say, well, you know, what what scriptures do you have? Well, I I got one scripture. Okay, what's that? And they, you tell me, and I and I think of three other scriptures that don't agree with that. Well, then you didn't get a revelation from God. God. God's word always agrees. God's word cannot contradict itself. So if, anytime you're reading your Bible and it seems like you find a scripture that sounds contrary to another scripture, you need to stop right there and say, God, I know that I'm ignorant. And I don't know everything. Say it. And you do. And I know your word can't contradict itself because you are the word. You can't lie. 
So obviously, there's something here I don't understand. Please show me what it is. See, don't ever say, well, I found where God missed it. No, that's not good to say something like, I found where God, God never misses it. So, it, it, either Jesus went to paradise that, that day, and if he did, then we got all these other verses that don't line up with that one point there, with that interpretation. Or what Jesus said was, I'm telling you today that you're going to be with me in paradise. That'd be like me telling my wife today, let's say today's Thursday. My wife's name's Lee. If I said, Lee, I just want to tell you today you're going to be with me in the mall on Monday. But I'm telling you today that you're going to be with me at the mall. When you go to the mall? Monday. So Jesus told the thief on the cross, I'm telling you today. This is what I'm letting you know this today. I'm not saying I'm going to paradise today. I'm just telling you today. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And people just read that and say, well, see, he went to paradise right now. He just said today you'll be with me. I'm telling you today you'll be with me in paradise. And if that's, if that's the way Jesus meant it, that lines up with the rest of the Bible. Makes sense. If Jesus meant I'm going to paradise right now, then that contradicts a whole lot of scriptures that say he, went to, he had to go to hell first to bear, pay our penalty for sin. And those scriptures say first he descended into the, into the abyss, into the lower regions, not Abraham's bosom, into the lower regions first. Does that make sense to y'all? Yeah. Yes. So I told you, you're going to have to do some thinking tonight. I want you to think about some things. Think about some scriptures. Because this will really help you now to, to understand as you, uh, the, the, the Bible as you read and study it. And it will clear up some, some questions you may have. And hopefully, you'll be able to go back and help other people that want to argue about that. Because it's so important to know that Jesus, that, that Jesus died spiritually. Because we couldn't be born again if he didn't. Couldn't be born again if he didn't. And another point that, uh, that people will bring out. And we won't get into that right now. But it's about Jesus' blood. You know, we're, we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And what a lot of, the argument that a lot of ministers use, they'll say, well, no, he did everything by his blood. It's really not that he went to hell or did all that. It's his blood. That's why our, it's his blood did everything. No, his blood didn't do everything. In the Old Testament, you know, every time those animals were sacrificed, every time they, they had to have blood for a sacrifice, remember they were a type of Jesus sacrifice, right? Every time those animals were sacrificed, they had to die, didn't they? You won't find a scripture where it says that they had a lamb, and you know when they need to sacrifice, the, the high priest would say, go get that lamb. They'd bring the lamb out, and they'd give him a knife, and they'd cut a little slit on his leg, got a little blood, put a Band-Aid on it. And the, band, the, the, the lamb's got like 55 Band-Aids on it all. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the land they use for blood, blood all the time. They keep putting it back in the corral. No. How do they get the blood? They Come kill on. the animal. Come on. You don't have to die to shed blood. You can shed blood shaven. That's right. See, if all Jesus had to do was just shed his blood, then God did Jesus a great, in, a great injustice by having him go to the cross, be nailed to the cross, Become a curse for us. Go to hell for us. Go to torments for us. That was a great injustice to the Son of God. If, if, if just, just the shedding of his blood was enough. See? Now this way you're going to get people to say, well, that's sacrilegious. Well, no, that's because you're religious. You're not biblical. See, Jesus shed his blood. He had to shed his blood, yeah, but through death. All the animals in the Old Testament, they shed their blood through death. They didn't just cut, cut, cut their leg and get a little blood. It had to be through death. If Jesus could totally redeem us just through shedding his blood, then he could have got up on a cup. He could have been at the Mount of Olives with 10,000 people out there, got up on a big old boulder, and, and said, hey, I want everybody's attention. I'm about to redeem humanity. He said, Peter, hand me that, uh, your, little, your little knife there. And he got Peter's knife. You know, He said, I'm about to redeem you. And he cut his wrist there. And the blood starts dripping over the ground. It, wouldn't that be called shedding of blood? Try it. It's all over the ground now. He's shedding his blood. He can say, you're, you're getting healed over here. You're getting delivered over here. Yeah, got four people just got saved right there. Yeah, that's happening right now. Everybody's getting redeemed. That would have been a lot easier than having to go to the cross and go to hell for us, wouldn't it? Yeah. So the question is, if, he didn't to if, he, if, if our redemption wasn't just in the shedding of the blood, why did he have to die? 
well, I'm going to get into that next time I come. Yeah. What he, the, he, there's a reason he had to die. The blood had to be shed from death. Come on. Praise God. I better stop. Y'all stand up.